A big day for President-elect Donald Trump as some major appointments for top positions in his administration are announced. Alabama Republican Senator Jeff Sessions for Attorney General, former Defense Intelligence Chief, retired Lieutenant General Michael Flynn for National Security Advisor, and Kansas Republican Congressman Mike Pompeo for CIA Director. All three have been outspoken critics of President Obama's counterterrorism and national security policies. Also, this afternoon, the Wall Street Journal is reporting that President-elect Trump is considering retired General David Petraeus for Defense Secretary. And we are delighted to be joined by Trump Transition Senior Advisor Kellyanne Conway. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Kimberly. We're very excited to have you on yeah. the five. So We're going to keep you here. I, exactly. <laughs> and this was great because it was kind of a last minute thing, but shows what a worker you are. That uh, you're like, no problem, I'll come straight over. And at four I, I skipped the motorcade to Bedminster <laughs> because I needed to finish a little bit of work, and I thought, let's just go over and have some fun. Did you take the subway? I did. I walked. <laughs> you did? I walked over there today. I walked. That, I walked too because the traffic is crazy yes, it's over just there. It's easier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's I love it. And it's 67 degrees. I'm, well, I'm a man of the people. <laughs> exactly. And as long as you have some sensible shoes, which I specialize in, uh, you'll be okay. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. All right, so we want to hear all the latest and greatest about the transition. Obviously, some big announcements today. What kind of feedback are you getting, and how do you feel about those choices? Excellent choices across the board, Kimberly. These are men of great character, all of whom are qualified to do their jobs on day one, which should be really the first criterion for any presidential appointment. And uh, folks who are loyal to President-elect Trump's vision of the way national security and counterterrorism should go. And in the case of Jeff Sessions of the Department of Justice, I think it's been a very politicized department of late. Hopefully he can bring it back to uh, the calibration where it should be. Uh, he's, a, he's been a well-respected federal prosecutor for 15 years, obviously a United States Senator from Alabama for about 20 years, a U.S. Attorney, I believe, from Alabama. So this is a man who spent his life in legislation and law enforcement. I've gotten to know him very well over the years in his legislative capacity and then certainly as two of the members of uh, Mr. Trump's core team during the campaign. I think they're all excellent choices and we shouldn't be surprised that President-elect Trump is staffing up with people who share his views on these issues that the American people apparently decide, decided that he would have the upper hand in governing. And his vision for uh, America. As uh, President Obama once said, elections have uh, consequences. Bowling. National Security Day t was today. Yes. And he announced three national security advisors, three people, two people in the cabinet, one, uh, one advisor. Congratulations, first of all. Number two, can we put something to rest right here, right now, that the transition team is not in disarray? I mean, th th this is the media narrative that's been going on for days, and here you have basically five announcements in, in the first nine days or ten days yeah. since he's been elected. That's fantastic. And I, it, firsthand, I will tell you, it's running smoothly. It really is, and not since we heard again and again that we had no path to victory have I heard something so inaccurate that the transition is not going smoothly. And I appreciated comments just this week, just yesterday really, from David Axelrod, from Vice President Biden, both basically conveying the same message to America, which is these, you don't form a government overnight. And in the case of Vice President Biden, he very clearly said that he feels confident that Trump and Pence will be ready on day one, that they, Obama and Biden, were not ready on day one. You can't expect them to. These, I, know, I know the media want stories and names and personnel and, and then going to attack the people that he puts forward as an extension of the campaign that should be over by now. But at the same time, give us time to really vet an interview. I mean, Trump has spent the better part of eight days mainly in Trump Tower, doing nothing but talking to heads of state, interviewing candidates for his senior staff or his cabinet, taking the counsel of his advisors and from many outside folks who are, are calling him. And you see now he's talking to everybody from Carly Fiorina to Ted Cruz, Jeb Bush called him, he's meeting with Mitt Romney tomorrow I, in Bedminster. I, I have to follow up though, Amazing. Kellyanne. You know this is coming. Uh-oh. What are you going to do? And oh. I honestly think you have to be there. You have to, you, if anyone knows that man, you know that man. Well, I know him enough to respect him. I have great affection for him and his family. I'm very happy he's going to be the president of the United States. It's good for the country. And uh, I will serve in my best and highest use. We're just trying to figure out what that is. But he has welcomed me to his administration. And I, I've said this before. I'll say what it here. What do you want, Kelly? What I want is for my four small children <laughs> to not suffer uh, oh, because their mom is in the White children, House. Always the children getting in the way. <laughs> <laughs> not, not at all. But... I would be a hypocrite to say otherwise, um, but they're great kids, and they'll flourish either way. But I, I do look. It's an important. It's an important decision. They're a personal and professional 
considerations at hand, mm -hmm. and I, I just, I know I'll be there for he and Vice President Elect Pence, uh, whom I've been close to for many years, who I was with today, and I think is going to be a phenomenal Vice President. But we're figuring that out. I told him, don't worry about me; it'll all come together. But I'll be there. Mm -hmm. Were you serious? Like a typical amazing mom, not making it about herself. So we respect that. I think that's important because your role as a mother is hugely important as to many mothers across the country too. Danny, you have a question. Well, I was, I have lots of questions. I, I guess I want to ask about the news about, well, I don't know if it's news, but the Wall Street Journal reporting about David Petraeus because I think that would be amazing. Um, and you probably can't comment on it because I know what your position is. So can I ask you about it? Sure, you can ask And me. then you can say no comment. <laughs> <laughs> just so it's on the record. Well, but I will tell you about uh, David Petraeus and others. We just seem to have a very long list of possible candidates for each of these positions. I've seen the list. And they're robust. They're filled with people who would not surprise you. And then they're filled with a couple of people who would surprise you. Mm -hmm. But I think what President-elect Trump is trying to do, Dana, is really think about how everybody would work together and I know in the heat of the campaign, in the fog of war, people have their gladiator costumes on and they look at each other through a political lens. But the fact is you have to look past that when you're forming a government. I don't want Donald Trump to turn into some mushy Hallmark card. You know, he's a tough leader in America, elected him to be a tough leader and to do some really significant things in short order, and indeed he will. But that aside, this is a man who, in business for many years, knows how to build consensus, knows how to cut deals, knows how to negotiate, but in the best interest of what he is, what, what his fiduciary duty is. And his fiduciary duty here is to the American people and those that he promised to represent. Having said that, he is meeting with, he's meeting with Mitt Romney tomorrow. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean it leads to a cabinet position. Not, he's had probably 70 meetings, 60 meetings. Not all of them are going to get cabinet right. positions. But he learns a great deal. I think in the case of um, General Petraeus, obviously he's well respected across the aisle. You want the best mm -hmm. and the brightest in your administration. This is about America. This is about the world. And in the case of Governor Romney, I think these are two businessmen who will talk about job creation. And I think a lot of what Mitt Romney talked about in 2012 about the world has become true, actually. That's true. Great point, especially as it relates to Russia. Greg, a sensible question. A sensible? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Skipping to one. Yeah, uh, <laughs> when, I, when I want to assess a situation, I, do the, I call it the RVE. That's the, rev the reverse view equation. I turn on the view. And whatever they say, I assume the opposite is actually the truth. And they are apoplectic about these appointments. They, they're, they're worried about uh, General Flynn. They're worried about uh, Jeff Sessions. Everybody's a racist. Um, what do you make of the hysteria that always seems to happen when there's a Republican in office at the start? I make of it that many people are still fighting the last war, meaning from nine days ago, the campaign. Folks, the campaign is over. He is your president, even if you have hashtag not my president. Mm -hmm. I think, Greg, that everybody was asking the right questions about the wrong candidate and their mm -hmm. supporters. They were saying, will Donald Trump accept the election results? Right. Will he right. stop the protesters from, are right. you kidding me? I couldn't even walk to work last Saturday. There were 20,000 people there, not to greet me, mm -hmm. uh, called mm -hmm. protesters, and some of them not so nice, by the way. Yeah. And, and the fact is that you have to get over it and you have to realize that no one Donald Trump appoints will make them happy. That's just right. a fact because the wrong guy won. Mm -hmm. They were for the other team and they're still for the other team. They're not yet quite Team America and they should be. So that goes for a whole lot of them. The other thing is I think most of the media did the world a disservice by not preparing them for the possibility of Donald Trump winning the presidency. It simply was not part of the conversation mm -hmm. when it should have been. The cues and clues were there all of the time. People wanted change. Mm -hmm. They did not trust or like her much. They, they, she didn't have a positive, uplifting, aspirational message at the end. He did, actually, at all. At all. Mm -hmm. it, her campaign was about him and his campaign was about people. So I think that people should have really looked at, looked at the electorate differently. I still feel like a lot of these folks who cover America don't understand America. And if that is the one thing I can offer from this election. It's stop listening to each other, you know, those who are breathing in the rarefied air of politics or media or donor, the donor class. Stop listening just to each other and start, start listening to people mm -hmm. because they were very honest from the very beginning about what their fears and frustrations and aspirations were, and they brought it right to the ballot box. Would it, uh, would he you, was listening. Are you glad you didn't, get a, you didn't go against Bernie? Do you think Bernie would have had a better chance? Than oh, Bernie? you mean the general? Yeah. No, I don't think this country would elect a socialist, uh, but I, I did. But, Barack but, Obama? But watching the... But mm. watching the Another socialist. Watching the uh, <laughs> pro Democratic <laughs> primary, we did see a great deal of vulnerability in Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. And we saw, and we actually chose states early on like Iowa and then Michigan where she had not done well in the primaries, especially Iowa 2008 where she came in third after yeah. Barack Obama and John Edwards. And we thought she really never went back to Michigan to try to 
sew that up, heal that. She, I think she went to Flint and a couple of other places. But these, these states, a lot of these, these places felt like the Donald Trump message writ large. Um, and people forget Bernie Sanders won 22 states and millions mm, yeah. and millions of votes. And threw some shade at her this week on The View, in fact. On The View. I know you was a pollster. So let me ask you two quick polling questions. One is, when you look at Corey Lewandowski going over to London, to the Oxford Union, saying it was Comey in the last weekend that really shifted this election and gave it to Donald Trump. And, of course, Donald Trump has said he doesn't know what he's going to do with Comey. And Hillary Clinton has said she believes Comey is responsible. What does the pollster think? The pollster doesn't agree with either of those wholesale, and here's why. The poll started to tighten before the Comey announcement on October 28th, and it was due in large part to Trump being out there talking about Obamacare. Because at that moment, people were opening up their mailboxes and firing up their computers, and they were getting Obamacare premium increase notices. And Obamacare really is the issue in the off-year elections one, as you know, 2010, 2014, Absolutely. that won the Republicans everything. They couldn't do it in 2012 because they nominated the political cover and inspirational blueprint for Obamacare and Romney Care. But that aside, people have felt really frustrated that Obamacare for many Americans is the most is the best example of how invasive, okay, intrusive, so you think expensive, it was, expensive. You think it was Obamacare that did it, not Comey. No, I think it's a com combination of things. That was thing. a combination of well, it was me, a combination of things. And then, and then finally, Comey about... Hurt, but, 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 well, and let's be fair. Hillary said on that Friday night uh -huh. when Comey made his announcement, October 20th, she came out and said, people have already decided about the, how they feel about the email scandal. It's a, her advisor said on the Sunday shows, it's quote, baked in the cake. So they can't have it both ways. They can't right. say nobody cares. And then when she loses, yeah. oh, my God, this man cost us the election. Listen, she's been running for president for decades. But and that, definitely was the last Corey, years, that was Corey said that. She had... She had, uh, she's been running for president for a very long time. She had all this time to find a better way to connect with the American people, to, to really scratch the surface of the issues that they tell pollsters they care about. It just wasn't there. Lack of capacity, and it was a, wasn't heartfelt. She didn't have it in her, so that's what happened. President Obama is on his way to Peru right now. He'll participate in an Asian Pacific Economic Summit. Protesters are already demonstrating against his visit there, and the president of the host country is warning against what he considers growing hostility to free trade that threatens the global economy. Correspondent Rich Edson has the story tonight from Lima, Peru. In nine weeks, these men will lead the United States government. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is another disaster done and pushed by special interests who want to rape our country, just a continuing rape of our country. they got to fix it, and they haven't done that. So it's certainly not going to be brought up this year. Yet this man is still president, and his administration continues pushing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the 12-nation free trade agreement the Obama administration negotiated and, without congressional approval, is void. Strengthened workers' rights and environmental rights, leveled the playing field, and as a consequence would be good for American workers and American businesses. This weekend, as he has in the past, the current president attends the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, summit in Lima, Peru. The summit is President Obama's final stop of his final foreign trip in office. 21 Pacific nations make up APEC, representing more than 40 percent of global trade. More than half of these nations agreed to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Saturday, President Obama meets with those world leaders to discuss that trade deal. Yet another issue this president must address and can offer little assurance to his international counterparts on what exactly the world's largest economy will do under the next administration. I suspect the incoming administration has not yet thought about it very hard and doesn't know itself what it's going to do. And so all that suggests we do have a holding pattern for a while. The administration warns failure to ratify that deal means these Pacific nations will turn to a competing arrangement China is pushing. Chinese President Xi Jinping is also attending the APEC summit. He and President Obama will meet Saturday. Not on the president's schedule, a meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Before traveling here to Peru for this summit, Abe already met with President-elect Donald Trump the first foreign leader to do so, looking to the future of his country's relationship with the United States. Another potential meeting for President Obama at this summit, Russian President Vladimir Putin. The White House is acknowledging a statement from the Kremlin. The two may meet at this summit. Plenty to discuss if they do. There's the war in Syria, the election of Donald Trump, and claims by the Obama administration Russia tried to interfere in the U.S. election by hacking Democrats' computers and releasing that information.
Brett. Rich Edson traveling with the president, live tonight in Lima. Rich, thank you. Pompeo brings an impressive resume to the role of CIA director should he get confirmed. Graduating first in his class at the U.S. Military Academy, graduating from Harvard Law School, editing the Harvard Review. Tonight, Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge on the man who could be America's top spy. Mike Pompeo. The selection of Kansas Republican Mike Pompeo, a West Point grad who sits on the House Intelligence Committee, was welcomed by a former CIA director. I was heartened. I think this is a serious man who takes these questions seriously and who studied these questions. Pompeo's signature issues include Iran, where along with Republican Senator Tom Cotton, he exposed secret side deals in the administration's nuclear agreement. The three-term congressman also investigated the flawed 2014 intelligence on ISIS that painted a rosy picture of administration progress when the terror group was expanding its footprint in Iraq and Syria. At a hearing Thursday, Pompeo expressed outrage that no one has lost their job for putting lives at risk. Um, I have to tell you that the American people, our soldiers, and sailors, airmen, and Marines deserve not to wait two years to hold accountable folks who put bad information in the field. Described as a national security hawk, Pompeo sat on the Benghazi Select Committee that investigated the 2012 terrorist attack that killed four Americans. He chastised Hillary Clinton and her State Department team for ignoring the rising terrorist threat in Libya because it did not fit the administration's political narrative. And on the failure to launch a rescue during the attack. I find it morally reprehensible and behavior that if it was your son or your daughter or one of your family members or friends who were on the ground that night and you watched the actions in Washington, D.C., you'd have every right to be disgusted. The senior Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee praised Pompeo as smart and open-minded, but voiced reservations. Mike is going to have to set aside uh, that very partisan role that he can play, has played at times uh, in the Congress, uh, and certainly did play on the Benghazi Committee. Uh, I'm confident he can do that, uh, and we're going to rely on him to do that, because the job of CIA director has to be strictly nonpartisan. Pompeo favors leaving the Guantanamo detention camps open. Open, getting back into the controversial business of interrogating terror suspects, and he supports NSA collection programs. In a statement, the ACLU said his, quote, positions on bulk surveillance and Guantanamo Bay also raise serious civil liberties concerns about privacy and due process. If confirmed by the full Senate, Pompeo will lead an agency of 21,000 employees spread across the globe with a budget of $15 billion. Former CIA officers tell Fox News the priority for the next director is rebuilding the agency agency's human spying capabilities, Brett. Captain, thank you. And we start off with Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel with a big reward for one of Trump's most loyal supporters. Good evening, Mike. Brett, good evening. Jeff Sessions has served in the Senate for 20 years. If confirmed by his colleagues to be the next Attorney General, there is no doubt Sessions will enforce the nation's immigration laws. Americans can't continue to, uh, to bring in labor to do work and subsidize people who are not working by the millions. Sessions was one of the toughest conservative critics of bipartisan immigration reform in 2013, concerned it would lead to what he argued would be amnesty for millions of illegal immigrants in this country. That likely made him a natural as the first senator to back Donald Trump in the 2016 campaign wow. after Trump spoke forcefully about building a wall to protect our southern border. We're going to build a wall. Mexico's going to pay for the wall. Sessions also defended Trump's call for extreme vetting for those seeking to come to the U.S. If you have two people and one that wants to believe in the Democratic Republic like we have, one that has a, a ideology that wants to impose a narrow view of how the government should be run, a theocracy, uh, then why would you not uh, choose the one who's most harmonious with our values? His loyalty to Trump from the beginning is being rewarded, and a fellow Senate conservative praised his selection. Jeff Sessions is a good friend, and I think he will make an excellent attorney general. He is a strong, principled conservative, uh, and... We are going to need a strong attorney general to restore integrity at the Department of Justice. Yet Sessions has faced some controversy. He was nominated in 1986 to be a judge on the U.S. District Court in Alabama. The Senate Judiciary Committee rejected his nomination after he had been accused of calling the KKK OK until he found out they smoked marijuana and reportedly called the only black county commissioner in Mobile the N-word.
In an interview with Chris Wallace for Fox News Sunday, the next Senate Democratic leader said Sessions won't get special treatment. Will he have any trouble getting through the Senate now? He's going to need a very thorough vetting. Many of those statements, they're old, but they're still troubling. And the idea that Jeff Sessions is, is just because he's a senator, he should get through without a series of very tough questions, particularly given those early, early things, no way. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has announced he strongly supports the Sessions nomination, calling him principled, forthright, and hardworking. Leadership aides say the Senate will consider nominations in a thorough and timely manner to ensure a smooth transition between administrations. Brett? Mike, thank you. For some analysis of the first Trump picks, Steve Hayes, senior writer for the Weekly Standard, Mara Lyason, national political correspondent of National Public Radio, and Tom Rogan, columnist for National Review and Opportunity Lives. Uh, the president-elect tweeting out today, we'll be working all weekend in choosing the great men and women who will be helping to make America great again. He's in Bedminster, New Jersey, uh, for meetings among them uh, Mitt Romney tomorrow. Uh, let's start about these picks today. Sessions, Pompeo, and Flynn. Steve, uh, Pompeo first. Uh, we talked about it yesterday with Devin Nunes, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. Uh, he, he brings a long resume to that job. Well, and Nunes is on the executive committee of the transition team. I would imagine that he had some role in pushing Mike Pompeo. Look, Mike Pompeo is one of the brightest members of Congress. He, that's certainly been true in my experience in talking to him and interviewing him and looking at the way that he studies issues. A lot of times you have members of Congress who will read questions or talking points presented to them by their staff and then can't really go beyond those in a hearing. Or, that's not a problem with Pompeo. He knows these issues. He knows them well. He asks the relevant questions, as you saw in, in uh, the package. He's respected by members of both sides of the aisle. Uh, that's, I think that is a, an incredibly solid choice. I would expect he'll have virtually no difficulty uh, getting through. Uh, perhaps some Buddy who would be concerned is Iran. Uh, he's got a pretty aggressive Iran view about the president, current president's mm -hmm. policies, uh, as does Lieutenant General Flynn, obviously. Yeah, look, these choices are competent. They are, at least with Flynn and, and Sessions, really loyal to Donald Trump, so he chose mostly from the inner circle. But I do think the orientation to Russia is something that I've heard from Democrats and Republicans are giving people pause. This is definitely Trump's vision that Russia isn't our number one enemy. We should, you know, almost consider them an ally. He's expressed lots of positive feelings about Vladimir Putin. Certainly General Flynn agrees with him on that. Uh, but otherwise, I think they're tough on Iran, they want to make ISIS a top priority, uh, but they definitely reflect this new orientation that's shaking up a lot of our traditional allies around the world. Well, to your point, he was on Fox and Friends uh, November 9th. This is Lieutenant General Flynn. What should Iran, Russia, uh, and maybe even Syrian President Assad know about a Donald Trump foreign policy? Well, I'll tell you what, it's going to be one that leads from the front. You cannot have a complex, uncertain world that we have and have a depleted military. No strength. Uh, he didn't get into the details, as you mentioned. Well, those are the big questions, though, because yeah. Assad sees Donald Trump's election as a positive thing. So does Putin. And at least in Syria, the United States will be on the side of Iran if they side with Assad and Russia. Tom. Yeah, well, one of the interesting things about Syria at the moment is you've actually seen the Russians continue this aggressive campaign against Aleppo, which to me suggests they're not quite sure about Trump. Uh, if they thought very confidently that he was going to be in their you know, back pocket, as it were, they would wait simply and sort of build some consensus, look, we're conceding, and then go at that point. One of the things that's interesting about General Flynn, I spoke to someone at JSOC who used to serve uh, with Flynn at JSOC. Special uh, Operations Command. Exactly, yeah, Joint Special Operations Command, who said that... Uh, Flynn's nickname there was the fire hose, in this, and, and not in a good way, that he had a reputation uh, for going off the rails a little bit, being a bit of a bully to uh, subordinates, and that if he wasn't tempered specifically into a task, that there would be some difficulties. And I think you see that in terms of some of the concerns people are expressing. Yeah, the most important thing in that job is the trust in between the president and the and national security the agency process. Right. Um, any red flags here for, obviously, Flynn does not need to be confirmed. Uh, you mentioned Pompeo, Sessions. No, I think um, 
as we saw in the clip uh, from the Chris Wallace interview with Chuck Schumer, I think Democrats would like to make an issue of Jeff Sessions' nomination, would, would like to have a fight, uh, despite the fact that he's a colleague, despite the fact that he's a senator, because they want to highlight these issues. that does give issues. you additional uh, points when you have a Senate confirmation, if they're coming from your yes. group, the senators. It, it usually does. I expect that in the end it will, but I think that Democrats will prepare for a big fight because they think they can exact some political uh, price for having chosen Jeff Sessions given what he said in the past. Just a, a comment on Mike Flynn for a minute. I think Mara's right to raise the, the questions about Russia. Certainly we'll hear more about that. It also shouldn't be, it should be more than just an asterisk, asterisk that he was right about Al-Qaeda and ISIS. He was in the intelligence community, one of the only voices in the intelligence community, sounding the alarms in 2012, 2013, 2014, about the rise of Al-Qaeda, the continued uh, proliferation of, of Al-Qaeda, the growth of Al-Qaeda offshoots, including ISIS. It turns out the guy was right. I mean, the New York Times wrote a profile of him today and had that literally as a parenthetical. That's not a small thing to have been right. Right. about the enemy in the global war on terror. Pushing up against the administration that was trying to diminish exactly. the, the ISIS-Al Qaeda threat and um, essentially saying it wasn't wasn't a big deal. And I, and I think you know that's absolutely right and he has that reputation, he earned it uh, correctly but I, I think it does show that there is controversy still surrounding him from the right. Yes Russia is the big motivator on that but these other issues, if, if those if it was purely about that record of predicting and assessing and pushing the administration, I, I think he would be a shoe in but he isn't. And, and well, so there is that. It doesn't yeah. have to be a shoe in well, well, there yeah. yeah. There's no yeah. confirmation. Yeah. Yeah, All right, I want to go forward uh, and a couple of the big picks that are coming, Mara. Uh, Secretary of State, we're hearing all kinds of names. Rudy Giuliani still uh, in the mix here, even though uh, you know there are all kinds of stories, whether his chances were diminished or not, he still apparently wants it. Uh, John Bolton, Senator Bob Corker from Tennessee, David Petraeus, and now Mitt Romney on this list, uh, who really? Donald Trump meets, meets with right, tomorrow. Meets with tomorrow. The most interesting thing there is the Rudy Giuliani versus Mitt Romney. Rudy Giuliani was the absolute most loyal, loyal soldier to, to Donald Trump. After the Access Hollywood tape, he was out there more than anyone else. Even, even Mike Pence went to ground at that point. Um, and he is, we heard earlier, he could have whatever he wanted, and he wants state. But Mitt Romney has a different world view. Mitt Romney, remember, famously said Russia was the number one threat. Geopolitical the threat, States. right. Geopolitical threat. And he has a very different world view than Donald Trump and the kind of soft on Russia, whatever we want to call them, guys around him. That would be an interesting pick uh, if he went with Mitt Romney. That yeah. would send a really big message that he wants to have different views. rivals, different views, reaching out to the establishment who shunned him. And don't forget, Donald Trump has a long memory. He doesn't like to forgive. Mitt Romney was one of his most prominent detractors. If not the, the most, most prominent. prominent. Defense Secretary, let's look at this list. Uh, we mentioned Senator Tom Cotton from Arkansas. Uh, Senator Kelly Ayotte's name had come out. Uh, she lost that Senate uh, re-election bid in New Hampshire. Uh, Jack Keane, who we know well here, former general, um, and James Mattis's name, uh, former Marine general, has popped up, and David Petraeus today uh, has come up as well. Uh, Steve, that list. That's a heck of a list. Um, I would be surprised if James Mattis, who's now at the Hoover Institution um, writing books and doing sort of big thinking, would, would come back, uh, but certainly that would be greeted with cheers and applause from the, the ranks and file military, particularly the Marine Corps, uh, because of who he is and the reputation that he has. Um, Jack Keane, as you say, sort of speaks for himself. I do think Tom Cotton is getting serious consideration here. Uh, he's young, but talk about a resume. I mean, Tom Cotton has, has uh, he served, he uh, has, has studied these things. He distinguished himself very early, first as a member of the House, then as a member of the Senate, as a, an outspoken proponent of American power and somebody who understands the use of American power or sort of well beyond beyond his years. I will say that the Pentagon, having covered it for six and a half years, is a massive mm. bureaucracy. And uh, you wonder whether you need to have someone who has run something before, whether it be a company or something big. Right. I mean, I think one of the interesting things is with Mattis that he does have that, uh, you know, that the, the warrior scholar is his sort of reputation. And, and so he would be very popular. He was also the com CENTCOM commander. Um, so he has managerial experience within DOD. The question is, how much does he want to embrace that bureaucracy? I mean, Bob Gates, for example, former defense secretary said, you know, you couldn't drag me back to Washington to deal with it because I think by far it's the hardest thing. The, the question here, though, is one of the interesting things from the secretary of state 
thing. Even if we talk about Giuliani and Romney as sort of different elements of the Trump campaign, both of them are very popular abroad. And I think that would be another example. I could imagine that sort of the foreign allies would be very, very happy with either of them because it would suggest that this is someone they have experience of uh, and can engage.